why it, why it is important and why we think this is going to be a food that's really going to change a, a, a lot of the way people eat. We evolved as hunters and gatherers, and really only in the past 10,000 years did we start to domesticate animals and plants for that matter. And typically during our evolutionary period where our DNA was developed, we ate 50% plant and 50% animal because they were hunters and, and gatherers. We didn't eat dairy products, we didn't eat oils, we didn't eat salt. The problem today is that we eat a lot of fats, we eat a lot of saturated fats, which are really bad, trans fats, I'm sure you've all heard of these things. And we eat a lot of what's called omega-6 fatty acids, while we eat very few omega-3s. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. When we have, during our evolutionary period, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 was about one to one based on what they ate. Today, normal Western diets I'm talking about here are 10 to 1, 20 to 1. We're way out of balance, and this is causing some issues with our health problems. And why? We've changed our nutritional habits from when we were uh, hunters gatherers, and we've changed the food. The composition of the food is, is dramatically changed. Why did the composition change? The agricultural revolution. Meat consumption decreased. And that's what happened, one of the things. But the Industrial Revolution really caused more things because we've really changed the composition of foods by fractioning and processing. And that's where the trans fats come from. A lot of, all of it essentially comes from food processing. If we take a look at our diets, the first column, the Paleolithic, that's when we evolved, and the current Western diets. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of these if you look at the amount of protein that we did eat, we ate a lot more protein compared to our current diets. Fat, a lot less, and you can see the 71 versus the 142 there. This uh, omega-6, omega-3 ratio, we've talked about that already. It's interesting, look at the cholesterol. Basically back then we ate as much cholesterol as we do now. We now know that eating cholesterol is not the problem. It's the cholesterol in you that's the important thing, and, and family history has much to do with how important cholesterol is anything else. The other thing is fiber. Um, we ate a lot more fiber back then. Carbs, eating about the same. So it's really these oil issues is what the big difference is between our evolutionary period and where we are today and why we have problems today. Some of the differences were due to wild animals were leaner. All of the beef we eat today is fattened in feedlots, fed corn, a lot of fat on there. We're getting a lot more fat with our meat unless you trim it off or buy uh, uh, clean, uh, trim meat. Foods uh, contained in the past high levels of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. And domesticated animals are fed with grains that have high omega-6s, low omega-3s. And that's what we've done is change the composition of whether it be, if you talk about a wild pig, a javelina versus a, a, a fed pig, or so on and so forth, it's changed the wild milk and everything else. The other interesting thing is we see a lot of propaganda, and I say propaganda about eating fish. Yes, it is good to eat fish. I don't want to run down um, eating fish. But the problem is, if they're, if they're from the wild, there isn't a problem. They eat the green things, if you will, in the, in, the, in the ocean. That's where they get the omega-3s from. If they're farmed fish, fish don't make omega-3s. They must be fed omega-3s to have omega-3s. So if they're fed wheat and soybeans, there's very low levels of omega-3. You may not be getting what you think. And I, I have a personal problem with USDA not uh, trying to limit or, or mark or you know, label these things to say how much is in them. Lipids, fatty acids, and human nutrition. I said a minute ago that the fats are what is their, one of our main problems today. If we talk about the main types of fats, you've got the saturated, which are really bad, you've got monounsaturated, and you've got the polyunsaturated. Okay, the first two we make in our body, wherever you get, uh, whatever you're eating from, we'll make saturated and monounsaturated. We really don't need to eat those. The last two, or the last one, polyunsaturated, they're called essential fatty acids because we cannot synthesize them in the body. We must eat them. And the other of interest are the trans fatty acids that come from processing, and we want to stay away from those. Coronary heart disease. 
What are the three main factors, risk factors? Smoking, high blood pressure, and cholesterol. Like I said, it's not how much cholesterol you eat, it's what is your cholesterol. And really this is, comes from two things. It comes from the family history and it comes from your diet. Other things in your diet besides eating cholesterol. Trans fatty acids, the saturated ones are actually the key things that we need to watch. And as I said, predominant, prom, predominant dietary factor contributing to coronary heart disease is the saturated fatty acids. Today in our diets, generally speaking, we get 38% of it from fats, our energy. 15% comes from these saturated fatty acids. The total energy should be less than 10%, so we're getting a lot of our energy from the fats, and that's leading to the obesity problems, health problems, and everything else. Muffas, that's the monounsaturated fatty acids. Oleic is the main one that uh, you get today. and it, has been overstressed in how beneficial this is, and they're coming to terms with that now in some of the more recent research that muffas aren't that important to eat. Here's another issue, Mediterranean diet. I think you've probably heard about this is the great diet, and there's been a lot of talk about that, and that's one of the things that you see olive oil everywhere nowadays. This contains olive oil, all these various types of olive oil. Well, the diet per se is correct, but what they did is when they did this study originally, it was done after the Second World War, and it was funded by the government of Crete. They neglected some aspects of the diet that really were more important than the olive oil. For example, lifestyle. These people had long, relaxing lunches, and they rested afterwards. That contributes, I think everyone would love to do that, but it also contributes to healthy in yourself, none, none of these rushed lunches. The people had active lives, okay? They were farmers, a lot of them. They worked hard, which is much better than sitting around eating and, 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 and not doing anything. And their diet actually had significant quantities of these omega-3 fatty acids. Oleic olive oil is omega-6. They were getting these omega-3s, they were eating things like purslane and a lot of nuts that have omega-3s in it. This was not taken into account. And so really the actual ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is closer to what is being recommended today and closer to our evolutionary diet. So the Mediterranean diet is correct, but it's not because of the olive oil alone. And that's something to, to be thinking about. PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3, there's two sources basically today, flax and chia, okay? The long chain omega-3s, these are what you get from fish, they're DHA and EPA, that's where they come from. And omega-6, canola, corn, soybeans. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of where these things come from. We'll talk a little bit more about this coming up. Sources of omega-3 fatty acids. The major sources that you can find in the world today is flax, and I'm sure all of you have heard about flax. There's a lot of uh, ads. You see it in even wild oats in a lot of stores in town selling various types of flax, organic, inorganic. Mahadan fish oil. That's the only fish oil that's approved by the USDA for human consumption. So those are the major sources in terms of quantities in the world. Minor, chia, and marine algae and chia because it is relatively new in terms of current uh, diets. Other interesting thing, in terms of dietary history, the long term, only chia and fish have been eaten for many, many years. Chia is more than 500 years and fish has been forever, basically. Short term, flax and algae have been eaten. Okay, so flax, you may hear a lot about it, but it really hasn't been in our human diet for very many years. Flax has been around for many years to make linen, papers like cigarette papers, linseed oil, and paints, but not as a food. Interesting about flaxseed. France actually has a law in the books, so you can go to the internet and find it, and it basically forbids the use of flax oil alone or in a food added to a food, and it's because it's got some things in it that aren't very healthy, and we'll talk about it a little bit. USDA actually states up to 12% flaxseed can safely be used. 
The Canadian government, where most of the flax for food is produced in the world today, actually states you shouldn't take flax if you're on any medications without a, uh, going to your doctor and finding out if it's safe, and they're limiting it to three months maximum consumption. Why? Flax contains cyanogenic glucos glucosides and antagonist B6 compounds. What the antagonist B6 compounds, they mess up your, uh, your vitamin B usage in the body and mess up your health, if you will. And the easiest way to understand how these things cause a problem, they use flaxseed today to produce omega-3 eggs. If you go in some of the supermarkets, you'll see enriched omega-3 eggs. And the eggs are enriched and they're fine. There's nothing wrong with the eggs. But a couple things happen. When they feed flax, if they go over 5% of the ration, the eggs start to smell and taste like fish. Not a good deal. How they get around this is they add vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, and then they, they tout, well, it's vitamin E enriched. OK, fine. But what happens with the hens? Actually, if they go over that amount, egg production goes down and hen weight decreases. These are the anti-nutritional compounds. Clearly, it's messing up the, the hen's uh, nutritional uh, balance, if you will. What's the problem with fish and fish oil? A lot of people in the world are allergic to this. The other thing is a lot of marine oils, they are hydrogenated. That increases the stability. So they won't go rancid and smell as, as bad or as, as quick. This reduces the omega-3 content, makes them less valuable. Fish oils contain cholesterol. Although this is not a big deal, I said how much you eat, they still contain it. And if you are susceptible to that, that's a problem. To toxic substances in fish. We see about mercury. We see about all kinds of heavy metals being uh, in the fish, whether it be from the wild or from fish farming, something to worry about. And as I said earlier, aquaculture, feeding fish would seem like a solution to a lot of these issues, but if they're not fed the omega-3s, you won't get the omega-3s from them. Sure, they'll have a little bit, but nothing like what you should be getting. Algae is another source of omega-3s, and this is relatively new food product. Basically, the problems with this are environmental. Um, they use sodium chloride. It's, it's algae that's grown in salt water. So you've got all this salty water they have to deal with. And the other thing is to get the, the omega-3 out of the algae, they use solvents. So there's chemicals involved. And any of you that are concerned about chemicals and ingestion and so on and so forth, there is an issue there you need to be aware of. Best comparison is chia versus flax. Flax has some problems, as I've already talked about. Chia has some advantages, which I'm going to talk about. But if you look at these, this table here, and we'll go through three tables, and I won't point everything out. But you look at the energy, the protein, they're very similar. You got the total fat content. Actually, flax has a little more. Carbs, chia has more carbs. So if you're on the Adkins diet, I guess that's not good. Fiber, a little more fiber, which is good. Fiber is good in our diet. We're low these days. Ash, we don't need to worry about. So very, very similar in a lot of ways. If you look at this, it's got a lot more chia now, the first line, a lot more calcium. And if you go down to sodium, it's got about a half the sodium. So people are concerned about so sodium issues. And you can, there's a number of other points there, but those are kind of the key ones that are of most interest to most people. And if we look at the fats in flax and we look in chia, total saturated, they got about the same amount of saturated, monounsaturated, flax has a lot more. And if you look at the total polyunsaturated, uh, that's the omega-6, omega-3, they're fairly similar as well. Here's some interesting things. Chia contains natural antioxidants, and flax doesn't. Any of you that purchase flax or look on the web if you want afterwards, you'll see that they sell it, and they say, we recommend you grind it fresh every day. The reason is, if you grind flax and leave it on your countertop, it's going to start to go rancid and start to smell fishy almost immediately because it doesn't have natural antioxidants. Chia has these natural antioxidants. In fact, the Aztecs, when I said they, from their tributes from the conquered nations, they received the chia as flour in a number of cases. Well, they wouldn't be bringing in flour if it was going to go rancid, because their refrigerators back then weren't so good. So it really is very, very stable. And this is one of the very nice things about chia. 
You don't have to grind it. First of all, it won't pass through you. Flax, if you don't grind flax, basically most of it's going to pass through you. You have a very hard shell on the seed. And so this is what we think is a big key factor. In addition to it, chia doesn't have the anti-nutritional compounds. How can chia be used? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you can feed it to animals to make healthier foods. You can feed it to chickens to actually change the eggs, the, the chicken, pork, change the pork composition in the milk. We can eat it directly. That's a much more direct way to get the omega-3s. Uh, you can mix it in water. This chia fresca, basically, you, you put it in water with a little bit of lime juice and a little sugar, if you like, and drink it down. Uh, you can bake it in breads, ground or not ground, as a topping as you would sesame uh, on the sesame buns, for example. Personally, I eat it every day and like it on, ser on salads. I just sprinkle it on the salad. So you need to get all the omega-3 you need, you need a big heaping tablespoon of chia every day. That's if you weren't getting it from other places. You do get omega-3s from anything that's green, first of all. So that's all you need. And you can put it in cereals, put it in yogurt, mix it in soups, any way you'd like a seed. There's no limit. It has a very nice flavor. I have some, any of you want to try a bit of chia up here, I have a bowl up here with a spoon in it. Come and try it and you'll find it. It basically has a nondescript. Some people say it's like sesame, some people say like nuts, others say like poppy seed, but it's very, very minimal flavor, if you will. I'm going to talk about some of the work we did to see how chia if you feed it to different animals, what happens? If you look on the left-hand column here, we've got uh, five diets. You've got a, one commercial diet. The next one, we fed 14% flaxseed. We fed fish meal, 14% chia, and another puree.